Welcome to the URI Landscape Architecture Lecture Series. We'll be getting away, uh, getting underway shortly. Before we do, I'd like to bring you a short video about the College of Arts and Sciences, which is where landscape architecture is located. Nobody is going to ever, ever replace the capacity of a human. And this is why thinking is our number one obsession. What's great about URI, especially in arts and sciences, we're a liberal arts college within a bigger school. And so you get that liberal arts feel, but you also get the ability to do research. We, as the flagship school of our state, do cutting edge work. You have to really look at schools as a place to grow as yourself. You're not going to be handheld anymore. This is a time for you to really delve into yourself and find what you like. It needs to be somewhere that you're going to find to be a home, but also a place to build yourself. And I think that URI does a great job of that. Students learn when they engage and get their own hands in that material. You're going to construct knowledge. You're going to do research. That's what creates transformative experiences. That's what creates people who are passionate about learning. Rather than simply acquiring a body of knowledge, they themselves are developing in a way that keeps them agile, constantly able to re-educate themselves, constantly able to think critically, to adapt to new ways of learning, new ways of thinking, and to keep evolving throughout the course of a life. Undergraduate liberal arts Education is so transformative to the mind, to who you are. The humanities and the arts are there to help you explore the fringes of what's possible. And understanding how you can look at the world in new and different ways and be ready whenever changes happen. Multiculturalism and multidisciplinarity are very important because it gives you a unique perspective. You see students are actually excited to see people that think about problems from a different perspective. Problem solving can be attacked from different point of view. It's nice to be able to come to a school where there's like so many different narratives, so many different perspectives. There's a place for everybody. I think really what URI has to offer is the people and the opportunities. The people around you, they're all going to help you grow in ways that you've never understood before. I think there's a lot of people, students in particular, that are just excited that whatever field they're in, they want to be the best at it. There's a sense of you know pride in the work that you put out there, and I think that's, that's kind of infectious. A College of Arts and Sciences education gives you the confidence to bring together all the strands that you value and apply them in ways that are fulfilling for you as an individual, but also resonate out. The thing that sets URI apart is that we as a faculty and as an institution ask our students not just what you can do, but who can you be. We're a small place, there's no denying that. I kind of think we're like a best kept secret. Hi, I'm, I'm Will Green. I'm the chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this evening's Landscape Architecture Lecture. Uh, before introducing our guest, I would like to acknowledge a few individuals uh, who help with our series. Leah Cooper, video and social media specialist in the Harrington School of Communication and Media has been helping us all year. Greatly appreciated. Students Lindsay Corsi and Miranda Hume have been helping uh, in the backstage and they are both seniors in landscape architecture. I'd also like to thank our department administrator uh, Lisa Smolinski. I also would like to thank our sponsors, 
uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, the University Libraries, the Department of Art and Art History, the Rhode Island Chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects, uh, the GP Faella Endowment, and the Landscape Architecture Department from the University of Connecticut. Uh, this banner that is flying or moving across your screen explains how during this lecture, when you get an idea that you want to learn more about or ask a question, it tells you how to do it. Um, and I hope that you will consider asking our guest questions. Uh, this evening, I am I'm privileged to introduce a friend and colleague, Jeff Howe. He's here to speak on the topic of activism, equity, and environmental justice. Um, and he's not here at Kingston. He's in Taipei. Um, he was hoping to be here. We selected a, a date later in the spring, but that's not the way it worked. So um, Jeff is going to be speaking from afar. Jeff is a professor of landscape architecture at the University of Washington, uh, where he's the director of the Urban Commons Lab, previously served as the chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture and graduate program coordinator. His research, teaching, and practice focus on community design, design activism, public space and democracy, and social and environmental justice. His work is international in nature and has taken him across the Pacific to work with indigenous tribes, farmers, fishers in Taipei, in Taiwan, neighborhood residents in Japan, villagers in China, and inner city immigrant youths and elders in North American cities. He has written extensively on the agency of citizens and communities in shaping the built environments. And he's been recognized for outstanding contributions as a researcher, a scholar, and a service provider. In 2019, he received the SELA Award for Excellence in Research. Earlier, he had received a SELA Award for Excellence in Service Learning Education. He's edited, co-authored, and co-edited numerous books and received Edra Great Places Book Awards in 2010, 12, and 2018. His community engagement work in Seattle's Chinatown International District has also been recognized with a Community Builder Award, a Golden Circle Award, and a Community Stewardship Award from the Washington chapter of the ASLA. Howe has a multidisciplinary background, having received a PhD in environmental planning and a master's in architecture from the University of California at Berkeley. He received his MLA from the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor in architecture from Cooper Union. I am really pleased to welcome Jeff Howe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Will. Uh, thank you for the invitation to join this lecture. As uh, you have just said, and as Will had said, uh, we were quite optimistic uh, when we uh, first had the conversation about coming to uh, uh, Rhode Island for uh, the lecture. Uh, I think one of the things that we have learned uh, over the past year uh, is patience. Uh, and there's a lot of struggle uh, at different places uh, in the world. I think another uh, uh, thing that we have learned in the past year that is that we really have to take a stance uh, as citizens and also as professionals uh, with the uh, reckoning of uh, social injustice that was brought upon us uh, with events from last year and also a long list of others before. Uh, I think it's clear that we need to rethink our role as uh, design professionals. Uh, whether uh, we uh, continue to be a, an accomplice to the systematic uh, injustice or that we choose to take a stance uh, and use design as a vehicle for change, uh, which is how I define uh, design activism. 
Uh, fortunately, uh, design activism uh, or design as a vehicle for change uh, is not new to landscape architecture. Uh, more than a century ago, uh, landscape architects, together with other professionals, uh, as well as civil leaders, uh, revolutionized the design of cities through the introduction of large urban parks. Uh, so, you know, uh, great expenses of uh, green space that brought uh, life, fresh air, and opportunity for social life into crowded uh, cities. Uh, so without the advocacy and, and professional activism uh, at the time, uh, New York City, for example, would not uh, be what it is uh, today. Uh, activism uh, in design is still with us today. Uh, take the example of the High Line, uh, without the foresight and the action of uh, Joshua David and Robert Hammond, uh, the Highland Park would not have uh, existed uh, today. Uh, although there are other consequences uh, when a project becomes too successful, as we uh, all realize. Uh, today, though, uh, design as, as a vehicle for change uh, need to address more than just adding new parks. Uh, we are faced uh, with crisis of planetary scale, uh, with melting ice cap in both, uh, both North and South Poles, uh, leading to rising sea levels, disruption to the ocean currents, uh, extreme uh, weather patterns, uh, and uh, with the most vulnerable communities in the world often on the front line of these crises. Uh, so the issues and challenges facing these communities require us to go beyond uh, practices that uh, sustain the status quo. Uh, and and I, I believe this is where design activism uh, can uh, play a very important role. Um, so designing uh, or educating uh, uh, landscape architecture students to become design activists uh, was the focus of my LAF fellowship uh, from 2019 to 2020, uh, focusing on uh, design as a vehicle for change, uh, starting with education. And uh, from the year long uh, conversation with a working group, uh, basically a, a uh, a network of colleagues around the country, uh, we develop a set of principles to guide uh, you know, different strategies or tactics that could uh, enable programs to undertake uh, actions to uh, integrate design activism into their curriculum or program activities. Uh, but that's not what I want to uh, talk about today. Uh, I have already uh, presented this work at the RF uh, symposium last year. And there's also a, a website that uh, I will share with you at the end of my talk uh, today. Uh, instead, I, uh, what I wanted to do today is to uh, share with you kind of five simple things that we can begin to do uh, within our work. And most of this kind of uh, is built on my, my own work for focusing on community-based design. Uh, work that uh, enables us to kind of embed uh, activism in design, uh, to transform design into a vehicle for change. Uh, so first, uh, at the most fundamental level, uh, design activism is about taking actions, uh, using actions to uh, begin a, a process of change. Uh, so during uh, the Occupy protest movement in Seattle last year that uh, many of you uh, may have uh, seen on news media, uh, one thing I, I think that has not been reported as much was uh, actually a guerrilla garden uh, that was uh, very much part of the Occupy protest. Uh, so not only did the protesters occupy a six block area in Seattle to demand for uh, police accountability and reform, uh, a number of them also created a series of community gardens uh, as a way to uh, reclaim public space uh, for the underserved uh, community. Uh, so within days, uh, uh, in the very beginning of the protests, uh, the garden evolved into a working farm. Uh, so irrigation system were put in uh, with help from volunteers uh, and that include my, my own uh, former staff and students, uh, donated materials and supplies uh, kept pouring in. The garden became a way for people to build 
uh, a community on the protest site. The garden itself uh, also began to take on meanings and identities. Uh, it helped to recenter the narrative of the movement, uh, which is uh, about addressing the longstanding social inequality uh, that uh, has deprived uh, the BIPOC community. All this started because of uh, one person, uh, Marcus Henderson, uh, who is uh, featured here, uh, who had a vision about Greta gardening, uh, took a shovel to the park and started digging. Uh, the garden was the result of the action that uh, Marcus took. Uh, even though the chop garden, uh, as we call it, uh, has ceased to operate after the protesters uh, have been uh, evicted, uh, volunteers from the garden have uh, since been working in other urban farms. So they have basically kind of branched out uh, and, and to carry on the momentum that they have created. So urban farms in communities of color uh, to address longstanding challenges in terms of the lack of economic opportunity uh, as well as access to fresh food. And the occupied protest has also uh, led to the ongoing effort to reform the police force in Seattle. Uh, for this fiscal year, uh, funding for the Seattle Police Department was cut by the city council by 20%. So that was the outcome that the, uh, the action ha uh, has produced. Okay, so uh, direct and spontaneous action, uh, as we have seen in the last example, can be powerful in addressing urgent needs. Uh, but there are also things that we uh, do as professionals uh, within the scope of our ongoing work to address longstanding social uh, challenges. So one uh, uh, project that, uh, have, that I have worked on early on my, in my career was the Union Point Park in Oakland, California. Uh, the park was uh, came out of a, 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 a very uh, kind of extensive process of community engagement, and uh, it was conceived to address a long-standing disparity between the amount of open space and the demographic of the community facing uh, located in the Fulbright uh, district. Uh, a neighborhood in Oakland with a high uh, population density, uh, a concentration of low-income uh, households, uh, and also a very low amount of open space per capita. Uh, by, but uh, providing more equal access to open space is, uh, is important, but it's not enough. Uh, to bring about structural changes, uh, we have to build capacity uh, in the community to empower our stakeholders uh, and uh, to take on challenges uh, other than the park uh, itself. For this project, we worked uh, with a local community organization to uh, recruit a group of youth, uh, uh, middle and high school students from the uh, local schools uh, to participate in a design workshop uh, to produce the design itself. So, so to really build capacity uh, through the design process uh, uh, so that the, the, the youth will be interested in uh, issues facing the community and knowing that they have the ability uh, to do something. Uh, so, so for this particular workshop, uh, our uh, goal was to basically take them through the entire design process to uh, help them familiarize with the design um, uh, profession also, uh, including uh, site uh, visits, site analysis, uh, concept and programming, model making and so, and so forth, all uh, in one day. Uh, the community organization in turn uh, makes sure that the design ideas uh, have been incorporated into the actual project. Uh, and uh, this is to, so the, the on top of the slide that you're looking at a rendering uh, that uh, show a really strong kind of resemblance with the model that the uh, youth have produced uh, from the workshop. So you can see how uh, the firms here, a PGA uh, based in Oakland and also uh, Mario Shetnam based in Mexico City, uh, their scheme that really echoes uh, the work that the youth had produced and it showed a level of, of respect that uh, unfortunately is not often seen uh, in a professional design uh, process. So this is the uh, completed uh, park. You can see that is so, so a rare kind of, uh, 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 kind of oasis in the middle of a kind of urban jungle. 
Uh, another project that we uh, worked on before uh, uh, that is related to this focus is the uh, International Children's Park, uh, in which uh, capacity building was also a very important component. Uh, you're looking at the before picture where uh, the uh, poor sidelines and a lot, uh, as well as other issues, uh, disrepair, for example, have led to the underutilization of the park. Uh, before uh, we started to work on this. In, in this project, we saw an opportunity for the youth, uh, again, uh, in the community to take a leadership role, uh, uh, specifically in uh, facilitating the intergenerational community workshop. Uh, so even though it's a children's park, uh, we realized that the more people use the park, the safer the park will be. And uh, so it's important to engage, uh, you know, different age groups uh, and also, you know, uh, residents as well as visitors. So our uh, bilingual high school students, uh, in this case, uh, play an important role in engaging uh, the multiple generations of users uh, and because of their linguistic uh, capacity. Uh, uh, games were developed that uh, also built on the skills that the community members already possess. In this case, the skills uh, in uh, eating the buffet meal. Uh, something that required no explanation uh, that, and also something that our elders in particular are quite good at uh, to the extent that, that it was almost like a, a competitive sports. Uh, so this is uh, what, uh, a game that we call Design Buffet and uh, it was also, uh, probably one of the most successful workshops that we ever did as, as soon as we announced that the game was like a buffet, people started to get in line. Uh, this is after they collected the, the uh, food materials, uh, or in this case, the uh, park design elements, uh, they come back to the table and know, they know intuitively kind of what to do, uh, and which is to uh, you know, really kind of assemble a design using the material that they have gathered. And then we mix together the uh, young people and the older people so that there are uh, opportunity for the informal uh, exchanges and, and uh, begin to develop a, a appreciation for uh, the different perspective. Uh, it's a children's park after all, so we also created a scaled down version for the kids. And uh, and then, you know, based on these exercises, we came up with a list uh, that identified common uh, preferences as well as different uh, preferences uh, between the different park users. and. Uh, and then uh, the park itself was completed in uh, 2012. In the face of complex social, economic, and uh, environmental challenges, it's not possible for us as designers uh, to do everything. Uh, one uh, way we could uh, overcome our limitation was to partner with others, so other specialists, uh, community organizations, uh, civil society groups, uh, you know, public sector and so forth uh, to uh, uh, develop a project to address the, the needs of the community. Uh, in Seattle's Chinatown International District, uh, the community engagement work that we have done over the last uh, 18 to uh, 19 years uh, would not have been possible without the partnership with uh, our local community based organizations that uh, provided us with the insights connection and uh, resources that are needed for uh, uh, those projects. So here you're looking at a, a long list of uh, projects uh, in the middle and the uh, community partners that we have worked with, uh, sometimes there are multiple community groups are working uh, on the same projects together. Uh, and also uh, groups that we have worked uh, consistently uh, over the years. Uh, so there is a, a process community uh, capacity building as well in working with these community organizations. Uh, one of those organizations was uh, WOW, the yeah, Wilderness Inner City Leadership Development. Uh, so this is the group of uh, high school students that we have worked uh, consistently with over uh, the past uh, couple of decades. The Friends of International Children's Park uh, was our partner in renovating uh, the, uh, the uh, International Children's Park. And uh, they were critical in uh, reaching out uh, to community stakeholders, uh, especially parents, and uh, and also holding the designers kind of accountable to uh, the input uh, from the community. 
Uh, today, they have continued to be involved uh, in park activation uh, through regular activities and programs, uh, including uh, various uh, festival events, uh, and also uh, the picture you're looking at here, the International Day of Children uh, celebration. Uh, it, it's uh, you know simple activity that but that continue to engage uh, the uh, the residents as well as uh, visitors from outside the community. Uh, this uh, uh, the, the celebration uh, here uh, features a concert by our own uh, local musicians. So another form of kind of capacity building, uh, if you will. Idea Space was another organization that we have uh, helped uh, establish in 2008. Uh, this is a, a full service community design center uh, located in the community. Uh, so uh, it's, it, they have a storefront location where, where people can walk in uh, to uh, participate in a workshop, in uh, you know, presentations, in meetings. And its, uh, it's presence was uh, phenomenal. The uh, idea space has been uh, absolutely critical in leveraging resources to uh, carry out projects uh, that have emerged from our design studios at UW, as well as you know, other community meetings. And uh, also, they have been critical in uh, uh, building consensus and also getting projects uh, implemented. Uh, here uh, on the slides, you're looking at the amount of uh, funding that it was able to uh, leverage in the first five years. Uh, so over $3 million in uh, neighborhood investments, uh, more than uh, 225 uh, property owners who have, they have uh, worked with uh, many, many volunteers that have participated in this process. Uh, some of the recent projects included uh, this uh, rather massive uh, hill climb that uh, connects a Hope 6 housing project uh, with uh, the Little Saigon neighborhood. Uh, so that the resident can access the business uh, down the hill uh, and the business can benefit from the new customer from above. Other projects included uh, the Hinkei Park expansion uh, that was completed in 2017 uh, and 2018. Uh, Informal Urban uh, Community Initiative is a series of projects that uh, began in Lima, Peru by my colleague Ben Spencer uh, at the University of uh, Washington, uh, Seattle, who uh, is now based in Nepal. Uh, similarly, these projects uh, would not have been carried out uh, without the partnership with the local community uh, and also local professionals, as well as our colleagues uh, uh, at the university in uh, global health and forest sciences. Uh, here is a uh, project to uh, basically uh, improve the school ground uh, using uh, indigenous uh, irrigation techniques. A project that have also uh, included this uh, fog water uh, system, a fog collector that uh, captures fresh water from uh, fog for uh, irrigation. And then the, the water storage facility in turn uh, provided an opportunity to, to uh, create a, a multifunctional sports course for the local community. Uh, Tabirito uh, Garden Technology was a, a more recent project in uh, Iquitos that uh, converted a uh, abandoned hillside uh, into a working uh, terrace garden for the local residents. Uh, again, partnership with the local actors, uh, residents and professionals you know, play an important role in uh, throughout all these projects. Okay, so, so next uh, to scale up our impact uh, beyond uh, just uh, site design, uh, we need to go upstream uh, to influence how decisions are made at the policy level. Uh, so one example uh, is uh, the project that we have done in Seattle. Uh, and you remember, you may remember from uh, January of last year that the uh, very first confirmed case of COVID-19 was reported uh, in, the, uh, in, in the suburb of Seattle. Uh, in March, uh, at, as soon as the shelter-in-place order was issued by our governor, uh, volunteer began to mobilize and, and coordinate donations, uh, preparations, and uh, delivery of food uh, to our elderly residents, uh, again, in the neighborhood of Chinatown International District. 
uh, people who could not uh, go outside and you know, because of their uh, are a higher risk group. And in the College of Built Environments uh, at the University of Washington, uh, we were uh, quite inspired by uh, these community mutual aid uh, initiative. And, uh, and a group of us, uh, faculty and students, uh, were uh, also interested in finding ways uh, to leverage our resources and expertise to help uh, those in need. Uh, one of uh, the uh, project that was brought to us uh, was a has to do with a major challenge in Seattle facing the unhoused, so people experiencing homelessness. Uh, we have a lot of people sleeping on the, uh, in tents on the streets with no adequate access to washroom facilities uh, to maintain personal hygiene. Uh, before the pandemic, they were uh, able to access public libraries, uh, community centers, and so forth. But during the pandemic, uh, these places were uh, longer accessible. The city uh, rented units uh, like these uh, as a temporary fix, uh, but they were costly to maintain and, and were also, also easily man, uh, vandalized. And so uh, we came up with this idea uh, to design a DIY uh, hand washing station uh, that anyone can build with parts that they can buy either online or off the shelves uh, and to install them on their own properties uh, that can be accessible to those in need. Uh, this unit becomes functional when it's, it's attached to an outdoor hospital. And also to meet the uh, regulatory requirement in Seattle, we added a uh, bioretention uh, planter to uh, cleanse the great water before it enters the sewer system. And, uh, and as you can see, the, the hand washing station compared to the, uh, the mobile uh, unit that uh, you see in the last slides also provided a more dignified experience for uh, those uh, who use it. This is uh, our, our team on the left, uh, including uh, Tiffany uh, McCoy, uh, the lady in uh, the orange jacket who uh, was a uh, organizer from Real Change, a homeless advocacy organization that uh, first uh, brought the issue to our attention. And uh, as soon as we posted uh, uh, the pictures of our first units online, uh, in the same evening, we got a message from uh, another community organization that was uh, interested in hosting uh, a similar unit. So this became the unit number two. Uh, and then the, I don't know if you have uh, seen this in the landscape architecture magazine, uh, the project also uh, caught the attention of the, uh, the publisher uh, who decided to feature this project in their July uh, issue. Uh, this is probably, I'm guessing, the, the lowest cost project ever featured in the magazine in this 100-year uh, history. Uh, the unit only cost uh, $400. The sink itself only is only $30 US. Uh, unfortunately, uh, on the day that the issue came out, our, our first unit was uh, vandalized. And uh, we later found out that uh, the uh, staff at the shelter actually turned off the water uh, uh, after uh, at the end of the day. Uh, so I think this may have caused frustration from people who wanted to access the, uh, the water and, uh, and then uh, therefore the, the vandalism that has uh, happened. Uh, but uh, it also had happened before. Uh, for some reason, uh, one of the lake went missing uh, and was, uh, we never were able to actually find it. Um, and, and we've been calling uh, uh, the uh, manufacturers trying to get hold of the lakes. Uh, and uh, as soon as they found out that we, uh, this is the project that we are doing, uh, they send us four boxes of these lakes uh, for free. And uh, the lakes uh, uh, actually were more costly than the uh, sink uh, itself. So we're very thankful that they were able to do that. Uh, and also a good thing about the DIY design uh, is that it could be easily fixed. Uh, so the sink is now uh, back at work and uh, the water is always on. So uh, no vandalism has happened since. Uh, we have a, a website and uh, with the help of the website and also social, social media, uh, organizations in and out of Seattle have been making and were adopting these units. These are some of the street sinks uh, that have been hosted by schools, by uh, nonprofit 
uh, organizations, uh, religious groups, uh, and so on, in and out of uh, Seattle. Uh, a few months ago, uh, we were contacted by a uh, research group uh, from the Duke University uh, that had borrowed our design and uh, got a permit actually from the city of Durham uh, to install the sinks in public spaces uh, around the city. Uh, my colleagues in architecture uh, who has been uh, working with us and uh, has, been, has been working on a second version, uh, the 2.0. Uh, version of the Seattle Street Sink, uh, which is uh, is meant to be much sturdier, using less parts, and also with a taller uh, bioretention planter, uh, which is heavier and harder to move, and uh, and also had you know greater capacity. We I think with the first unit we sort of underestimated the amount of uh, use that uh, these sinks uh, had. And also uh, this one, probably um, even more importantly, uh, has no legs. So there's no legs to uh, to break. It's also uh, more uh, so ADA uh, compliant. Uh, so the wheelchair can kind of move closer to uh, the sink. Uh, we also realized that by turning the, the, the sink uh, 90 degree that we could actually reduce some parts as well that we just need to kind of punch a few holes and allow the water to flow directly uh, into the planter. And uh, the finished unit has been adopted by a Sikh temple in uh, Renton, which is a city just outside Seattle. This is, uh, uh, if you're interested in building one, uh, you can go to the website and download the material that you need. There's a list of parts and uh, that you can uh, use to find uh, uh, them on, online or in your local hardware store. Uh, so, so while the project has been getting attention, uh, it was still not enough. Uh, I mean, this is the part about scaling up about policy. Uh, it was not enough to meet the overwhelming uh, you know, demand uh, in the city, uh, people on the street. Uh, so late last year, uh, our partner, uh, Real Change, uh, worked with the members of our city council to put the project on the city budget for this year, uh, which uh, has been approved. And uh, as a result, uh, you know, $100,000 was allocated to support uh, making of these uh, public, publicly accessible units throughout the city. And we estimated that the funding should be enough to put at least you know, 60 units on the streets. Uh, so going from uh, the sort of the initial ad hoc uh, DIY emergency response to uh, institutional actions and coordination to scale up the effort, uh, this is how we went uh, upstream uh, to influence how budget uh, uh, for uh, the city of Seattle was allocated. It's not a huge amount of money, but I think will make it make a difference for people whose uh, life depend on it. Uh, uh, obviously, this is you know far from uh, solving the issues of homelessness, uh, but it's the kind of support that can be critical during uh, an emergency. Uh, the last uh, dimension I want to address is uh, practice. Uh, by going upstream, uh, we need to influence how policies are made. Uh, and, and how budgets are allocated, but also how uh, landscape architecture can be practiced. Uh, we need to find alternative to uh, the traditional models of fee-for-service, uh, alternative to the status quo. Uh, the examples that I have shown uh, before uh, in this lecture are already models or alternative practices. Uh, so the case of Idea Space as a community-based design center uh, to drive uh, community-based uh, developments uh, and reinvestments. And, uh, and this is, uh, the idea space has been the place where uh, uh, we have uh, sent our students to, uh, to work as interns and also later to work as full-time staff. The role of community-based organizations uh, have played an important role also in the case of Unicorn Park uh, in Oakland and uh, you know, without which you know, the park uh, would not have happened. And also that the idea from the workshop uh, would not have uh, been uh, retained uh, in the final design. Uh, after years of working uh, in the field in Peru, uh, the informal urban community initiative 
has uh, recently evolved into a professional and transnational uh, nonprofit organization. And uh, the, this is called uh, Traction. Uh, so with field location now in uh, Peru, in uh, Cambodia, uh, and also in uh, Nepal, uh, working to improve uh, social and environmental well-being in uh, resource-limited uh, communities. Uh, there has uh, been a growing number of emerging practices uh, similar to uh, traction, uh, such as the uh, Kunki Design uh, Institute. And the, uh, this is a, a project uh, or a, a organization whose work uh, started in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, focusing on uh, community uh, public spaces uh, in the informal settlements uh, to build uh, uh, capacity while improving uh, local uh, sanitation conditions, uh, uh, water supplies, and so forth. And uh, since come home to uh, uh, California, uh, working with uh, communities of uh, Latinx farm workers, we were uh, very fortunate to be able to uh, uh, include uh, KDI's work uh, in our book, uh, Now Urbanism, The Future City uh, is here, published in uh, 2015. Okay, so to conclude, as you can see, uh, design activism is it's not necessarily a, uh, a radical departure uh, from what we do as designers and as landscape architects. Uh, although the intention is very uh, is very much kind of radical in the way uh, we conceive the how design can serve as a uh, vehicle for change, um, uh, there are ways that we can embed activism in things that we are already doing uh, within the scope of a project uh, in partnership with others to influence uh, decision making upstream uh, to rethink the model of our practice. Uh, and, and to take action to make uh, things happen. Uh, so to wrap up, this is uh, the website that I uh, promised you. This is uh, uh, the outcome, the result of uh, our LF fellowship work uh, that I have uh, been developing with a, a network of colleagues around the country. Uh, here on the website, you can uh, access the, uh, the framework uh, that we have developed and which is you know, uh, basically a written uh, document that uh, talks about opportunities uh, and also constraints and challenges within the educational systems to embed design activism into landscape architecture education. And then uh, there are also uh, kind of strategies and, and tactics and uh, examples of work uh, that has been done uh, as part of this uh, document. So you can find that under a uh, framework. Uh, there's also a list of resources, uh, written documents, uh, video clips, uh, podcasts that you can access to uh, learn about the work uh, that uh, many authors have done uh, uh, here uh, in the US and also internationally. And uh, so I hope you had a chance, uh, we'll have a chance to uh, take a look at the uh, website and, uh, and let us know if uh, there are things, uh, projects that, that you have come across or uh, suggestions that you may have. And you're also welcome to uh, check out our uh, work through the Urban Commons Lab. And I look forward to your uh, questions and feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, we have a number of comments and questions, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with one that um, grows out of the student work. Um, what are the skills your students need before they go into a neighborhood and how are they getting those skills? Mm -hmm. um, they are different approaches. Uh, I mean, the, our, in our program, uh, the community engaged work uh, happen mostly in the event studio. And so these are students who have already gone through sort of first year uh, foundations uh, studio. So have you know, a, a basic knowledge of you know, design, uh, uh, you know, construction, uh, you know, and you know, science engineering and so forth. Uh, so you know, the skill set that is enough 
uh, to you know, work on most projects that uh, we have come across in the community. Uh, and uh, uh, one, and then you know, through the, the the actual studio process, uh, then we uh, introduce them to the complexity of working with the community. Uh, the, the the kind of uh, sensitivity, uh, especially working with a, a communities of color, uh, underserved communities, and you know, you know issues and uh, things that we need to be aware of uh, as an outsider coming in. Uh, even though that we often have the invitation uh, from the community, there are things that still can can go wrong, and so so these are the process that uh, sort of you know you have to kind of learn by doing. Uh, it, it's not something that you can just introduce you know, in a lecture, uh, although there are things that you can do to 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 some extent. But I think the best way to do it is to actually uh, to to experience it. Uh, but I have also come across other model in which, uh, for example, my colleagues uh, here in Taiwan. Uh, in the program, uh, they do this in their in their first year. Uh, so at the end of the first year, so it's not that that different. Uh, but uh, oftentimes, I think when you introduce uh, community-based work later on uh, in the curriculum, I think students have already. Uh, 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 I think they seem to assume that you know, they they know everything. And, uh, and this is, you know, they use uh, jargons that the community organization or community members may not, not be familiar with. And so there's some advantage of introducing this early as well. So I think you know, both models can work. Uh, it's just that we need to uh, be conscious about our role as, as you know, somebody coming from outside and, and being sensitive uh, and, and respectful uh, to the community. Um, I have another question here. <clears throat> Um, the student um, likes uh, or loves hearing about innovative ways of engaging stakeholders, um, like the design buffet. What he's interested in knowing is what you did during, during, during this pandemic uh, to engage people, since engagement is part of every project that you seem to be doing. Yeah, that's, that's a really tough one. Uh, and so the... Uh, the street sync project was uh, one thing that we figured out that we could do uh, without you know, having to uh, ha you know, have you know, direct contact uh, you know, with people. Uh, we work, and this is where you know, partnership become a very important uh, vehicle. Uh, that you know, we work with people that have you know, deep knowledge about the issue uh, of the community stakeholder. In this case, the unhoused people on the streets, and so it was not necessary to. Uh, you know, go through the entire you know the conventional process a workshop of you know of charrette uh, to get you know people's uh, kind of input uh, these are folks that we have you know deep knowledge again about uh, the issue facing uh, you know these stakeholders and uh, so uh, so we were able to kind of work with our uh, uh, partner with you know, real change uh, you know through uh, you know, zoom meetings online meetings and uh, the construction uh, was done on site uh, with you know, just a few people who are able to kind of keep uh, you know, social distance. Uh, so that's kind of one uh, way that we figured out. And, and uh, so you know, the, the, the partnership aspect that I mentioned before in my lecture you know, became critically important, I think, in, uh, in the case of, of pandemic. I have also uh, seen others uh, uh, who have decided uh, you know, my, my colleagues in, in Manila, in, in the Philippines, you know, decided to really kind of shift gear. Uh, uh, so the focus of their project shifted from you know, neighborhood planning uh, to uh, actually uh, volunteering uh, and, and actually uh, 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 doing fundraising uh, online uh, to uh, you know, help you know, to provide uh, food, and uh, uh, you know, supplies to uh, the community they have been working with uh, before the pandemic. And uh, so the actual project uh, was on hold, but they were able to kind of leverage their connection uh, you know, to work with the community. And, and hopefully as soon as the pandemic uh, became uh, you know, under control, that the project can continue. Uh, but by then, I think they have developed a much stronger uh, level of trust uh, that could be important in the project itself. 
So one of uh, another question that uh, arises is related to um, climate change or sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And um, are any of your projects focusing on addressing sea level rise in low income underrepresented communities? Uh, not in my own work. Uh, so I think the, the point I wanted to address uh, in my lecture was that there, there are so many different things that we can do as landscape architects. And, uh, and we can start with the things that we're doing already. So, so my work is focusing more on community-based uh, design and, uh, and, and mostly in kind of inner, inner city uh, community. So that's kind of where uh, uh, you know, design activism is, is reflected in my own work. Uh, so I have not, uh, unfortunately, uh, worked directly with uh, uh, you know, community who are faced with you know, sea level rise. Uh, but uh, we, the, the kind of issue uh, my students have, though, uh, that we've been working, uh, for example, one of my thesis students last year, uh, her project was uh, working on a, a coastal uh, community in Jakarta. And uh, so we were trying to figure out ways that uh, we can begin to uh, 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 build uh, facilities, uh, so these kind of vertical evacuation structure uh, that could be uh, integrated into the community, and uh, not only to serve as you know, in, in a situation of emergency, uh, but also could be uh, there could be opportunity to embed a program that can uh, serve the community uh, on a regular basis. Right? Uh, so these uh, that in turn help. Uh, these uh, the vertical evacu evacuation structure to become places that people are familiar with and, uh, and they're, they're attached to. Uh, so it's not a, a place that they have to find uh, during emergency. These are places that they go on an everyday basis. Uh, so that's probably a project that, that comes closest to mind when it comes to sea level rise. Another question uh, is, has the idea space served as a model for other community design centers. And I want to add a little something to that. And how long does it take uh, your studios or your process to go from proposal to mm -hmm. completion? OK, that, that's an insider's question. <laughs> um, so it is a model that's already out there. So it's not a, a model that we invented. Uh, or my colleagues in the International District has, uh, have invented. Uh, this is a model that's been around for uh, you know, decades, since the 1960s, uh, with the community design uh, movement. I think, uh, but you know, each community is, uh, is different from you know, another. So there are things that probably that we do that others uh, don't. Uh, we, we, we have a very a multicultural community, so you know, communication is critically important. So we have to have you know, multilingual staff uh, and so forth. That's probably one thing that we, we do dif uh, slightly differently. Uh, in terms of you know, how long it takes from one project, you know, from conceptualization to completion, sometimes it would take, uh, uh, I think, uh, let's see, the, the Take the Children's Park, for example, we started, I think, in 2006. Uh, with uh, initial uh, outreach, and then we use the outreach to uh, put the project on the uh, ballot. Uh, we have a, a park levy uh, ballot, uh, I think in 2008. And so we were able to get a project on the ballot and get the funding that was needed. We also got multiple rounds of community matching uh, fund to uh, support uh, the design work. Uh, so the design was already a schematic design was already done before we went and, and asked the project to be put on the ballot. Uh, so there's a sequence of, of, of steps that was necessary to uh, get the project funded. Uh, so it, it was the project really kind of started from scratch. Uh, and then uh, there's a you know, like one year process you know, to work with the designers to file as the design and then probably another year uh, you know, to which the construction uh, uh, Kind of took place and the project was finished in 2012. So it was a six year long uh, process. And, uh, but that's that six years relatively reasonable. We had another project that we, the initial impetus was uh, back in 2000, uh, back in 2002. And the project was completed in 2010. 
uh, so eight years. So do you have multiple studios working and moving in at different stages? Is that how it works? Uh, this is, uh, yeah, so for some project, yes. Uh, for the Children's Park, uh, it was one studio. And then uh, basically the, uh, the idea space became a very important uh, player after that. So they were the one that sort of carry on the work. Uh, so this is uh, what I mentioned before. Uh, you know, the importance of the community partners, because uh, oftentimes that we come up with great ideas in, in the studio, but there's, uh, uh, there's not uh, somebody in the community who can kind of sort of you know, champion the ideas and, and find the, the kind of resources to uh, make it happen. Uh, so this is the role that uh, organization, that, that idea space has played in, in our community. Do you have multidisciplinary studios at UW? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we actually taught the, the very first one in 2009. This is a an ongoing uh, effort in our college to kind of break down the, the silos. And uh, so what uh, we have done was we introduced a sort of a curriculum overlay uh, uh, on top of you know the existing required uh, courses. And uh, so we free up you know, you know student. There's a sort of wildcard studio that a student can can take. Uh, they can take a studio from another department where they can take a, a, a joint studio that uh, the college has supported. And uh, these joint, joint studio, uh, they have, you have to have at least two faculty members from different departments. And they come up with the project, the ideas, and they submit a proposal to the college through a competitive process you know, that the, the studio was selected uh, for, uh, for each year. Uh, that's that's certainly very interesting. Um, I think that um, there are there was there's one question about a a fog collector for irrigation. Um, person uh, one student asked, can you talk more about the fog collectors? Um, why do you think it's not used more widely, or is it? Well, I think it's still an emerging uh, uh, technology, and uh, I think it is. I think one issue is is uh, cost, uh, and and if you know when things are sort of in the sort of emergent state, and you know without you know like for example like, you know venture capital or you know a a, 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 a influx of fund to really kind of. Uh, you know, Create an economy of scale, uh, and you know the, the cost issue could be a barrier. Uh, you know, and these are you know like really low-income uh, community. Community are a struggle, uh, and that's you know, one reason that they are you know, living in informal settlements. And so, so even the, the cost of uh, you know, building the units can, can be uh, prohibitive uh, for uh, the local communities. The project that my colleagues, uh, you know, Ben Spencer, had done, uh, they had the funding support from, from agencies uh, to make it happen. And, but these are still kind of you know, pilot project. Uh, in order to kind of scale up, uh, it needs to you know, have you know, support uh, from uh, you know, you know, local government, for example. Uh, and, uh, and, and then you know, there might be you know, a, a, a political struggle trying to you know, make something happen in, uh, in the most vulnerable communities. So those are the issues that, that uh, we still have to overcome. Um, one of our, uh, actually a couple of students have wanted to know what, it, what do you think is your most successful project and i would i would probably shift and say what was your most satisfying project i think uh one project that come to mind i don't know if it's most successful or not but it's certainly uh something that i, I, I really uh find kind of gratifying uh is the hinke park so i show a picture of that uh, early on uh one of the challenges for the park is to bring you know, the multi-racial, uh, multi-ethnic stakeholders together. Uh, we have a, in our community, there's a long history of, of, of conflict and, uh, and disagreements. Uh, and uh, through this project, there was, the process was still quite uh, contentious in the beginning. But uh, we figured out a way to kind of walk through, uh, you know, the differences 
and then uh, we, the project was completed. Uh, and then what happened was uh, after the project was finished was that the committee wanted to keep going. Uh, they wanted to add a, a sign, a multilingual uh, sign. And this was uh, unbelievable uh, uh, and, you know, for a, a group that was, you know, like uh, not necessarily fighting, but, you know, there was a lot of uh, tension and, and contention early on uh, for this group to uh, say that they want to keep uh, working together and to create a sign that has all the languages spoken uh, in the neighborhood uh, uh, reflected in the design. And uh, that, uh, I mean, other than the park itself, uh, that was a really gratifying uh, kind of outcome. And it really shows that the we can, you know, the design process can uh, play a very important role, uh, not only in terms of delivering the design, but also uh, to uh, you know, facilitate a, a kind of social change uh, that is much needed. Um, I think uh, I think that might. Oh, one other thing is, if, if someone wanted to purchase one of the sinks, how do they do that? Well, you can just uh, go to the website. I can uh, I can show with, with Will, and then uh, we can forward to, uh, to all of you uh, the link. But you, if you search, you know, Seattle Street Sink, uh, I'm sure you can you can find it as well. And so we, we don't actually sell the units. Uh, it's a DIY uh, design, so you have to buy the parts yourself and, and build it yourself. Uh, and so that's uh, uh, so that's the way uh, to do it. But we we have made make it simple there's also a video that shows how you can assemble the parts after you have uh, purchased them um i'm going to ask one uh, one last question um unless someone comes up with something um mine is it's related to your students and is there a conflict between communities and your students particularly when you're working when your students come in and they want to help mm -hmm. and you're dealing with young people and uh, and they're very different from each other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah we had there was one uh project uh it was a design for a night market and uh for that project we had a design studio and then we uh we wanted the student to kind of really kind of work with each other our student the uh, UW students, university students, uh, and, and the high school students. And, uh, and in the first session, uh, you know, we had uh, each week, they had one joint session together uh, to work with each other. We realized that the, uh, the high school students were uh, really intimidated by the university students uh, because, you know, they, our students tend to speak in jargons and they, they uh, have ideas, you know, right away, they can draw, uh, and the high school student was just completely uh, intimidated. And so we, uh, uh, the, the, and the social work, uh, our, our partner with IdeaSpace, uh, what we, we, while uh, reminded us that uh, they, they had a, a debriefing after the session and then found out about the struggle that the students uh, were having. Uh, I was not aware. So this is something that I learned as well uh, through our, our social work uh, partners. And so what we did was that we, uh, uh, for the next, the following session, uh, we designed a process that required everybody to uh, draw or write their ideas on a, on a piece of paper, uh, on an index card, and, uh, and put all the ideas on the table. So literally all, everything on the table. Uh, and uh, so, that, you know, so that allowed the high school student to participate you know, on an equal footing uh, with the uh, university students. And we also require that whatever design they come up with uh, needs to address all the ideas uh, in some way. Uh, that was a challenge to them uh, so that no one is, is left out. And uh, so that's, that was one example in which we were trying to resolve the, not necessarily a conflict, but I think there is a, a tension between uh, the community stakeholders and, and uh, our students. Um, well, there are a number of comments that are very impactful and relatable in an atmosphere of social struggle and change. Um, that's from one of our graduates, a recent graduate. And um, 
Yeah, I think I think we've gone through um, we've gone through just about everything. Uh, so I'm I'm going to wrap up. Uh, I want to thank you, Jeff. Um, for, it's a it's a, a wonderful topic, a really important topic. Not wonderful. Uh, it's thought provoking, and the presentation actually illustrates ways of making a difference. And I think that's so important. So I want to thank you very much for taking taking time and and sharing what you're doing, which is quite as astounding uh, with our audience and with us. So thank you. Thank you. I think that um, I want to say good night to everyone. I think we are very fortunate to have these individuals come and talk to us. This was a, another uh, moving and um, impactful uh, presentation. So until the next one, which will be a month from now, uh, we'll have Shannon Nickel coming from uh, Gustafson, um, Gust Gustafson, Guthrie, and Nickel. And until then, uh, looking forward to seeing you again, except I don't see you. Be well. <laughs>